Okay, so in part two of lesson six, we're going to look at the poet Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who was a, one of the founders of the pre-Raphaelite movement. And so studying him will give us an opportunity to study that movement, which is important because it was very impactful during the Victorian period, and we definitely need to cover it in our study. First, just a little bit about Dante Gabriel Rossetti. He's a son of an Italian patriot and scholar whose political activities led to his exile in England. So during the Victorian period, there was kind of this fascination with Italy. For instance, the Brownings lived in Italy, and um, a lot of the people they wrote about in their dramatic monologues were Italians, and other poets wrote about Italy as well. Um, George Eliot visited Italy and wrote about it. I think one of her novels is set during the Italian, yeah, Romola. George Eliot's novel, Romola, is set during the Italian Renaissance. And uh, there was especially um, a fixation on Italian art during the Victorian period, um, which we haven't really talked about this yet, and we will in this lecture. Um, but um, the Victorians were very interested in art, and in, in art um, to go along with the literature, the poetry, etc., was actually quite prominent during the Victorian period as well. And so there was all this fascination with Italy and especially Italian art, but um, Dante Gabriel Rossetti and the Rossetti family was actually originally from Italy before they moved um, to England when his father was forced into exile. Um, all four of the children in the family wrote, drew, and engaged in scholarly pursuits from a young age. So another example of a good, robust education at home with an emphasis on reading and writing. I think we're starting to see a pattern among these great authors. <clears throat> um, the siblings were actually important. The, this was a quite successful family. Um, Rossetti's brother was also a successful writer and painter who co-founded um, the pre-Raphaelite movement with him, and there's a selection by him in our textbook. But even more importantly, his sister Christina Rossetti was a quite accomplished, successful poet. And her poem, Goblin Market, which we'll study in the next lesson, Lesson 7, is one of the most famous and most interesting poems from all of um, Victorian literature. So that'll be exciting when we get there. His view of life and art derived from Keats. He is really influenced by Keats, um, as well as anticipated Pater and Wild. So in the next part of this lesson in just a few minutes we'll look at Oscar Wilde and Walter Pater who founded the aesthetic movement which was kind of the next movement in art after the pre-Raphaelite movement but it was very uh, pre-Raphaelite movement was very influential on aestheticism and on Pater and Wilde. Um, he had um, did have some tragedy in, the, in his life his wife uh, committed suicide in 1862 and I don't know that much about it I'm not a biographer of Rossetti, but uh, he was very much haunted by this. I don't know if it was really his fault, but he, he felt guilt over it. Um, <clears throat> and finally, just to kind of sum up and give you an idea of, of what he was like, he has been called by scholars as a painter in his poetry and a poet in his painting. So we're obviously mainly studying the poetry, but the two were equally important to him and he was equally productive in both, and they infused one another. And I think you can see when you read Jenny or read any of his poems that there is this um, visual aesthetic quality to them. So here's an example of pre raphaelitism We're going to talk about pre raphaelitism It's not as easy to say as I thought it'd be uh, <clears throat> before moving on and looking at Rossetti's poem, Jenny. And so this painting is uh, The Hired Shepherd is the name of it, and it's by William Holman Hunt, who, along with Rossetti, founded the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And um, it very much conveys the naturalism and the realism that were central to the first wave of the Pre-Raphaelite movement. Um, this picture is supposed to capture these two young lovers in this very natural setting, depicting life as it is in a natural way for a shepherd. Um, it's it's funny, George Eliot actually has an essay called The Natural History of German Life, where she um, 
presents her theory of realism, and she argues that the English realists are not very realistic, and they should borrow from the German realists, who, in her opinion, were more realistic. And she discusses this painting and critiques it, saying if you look at it, it's not actually very realistic. It's very idyllic. Um, life as a peasant, as a shepherd, was hard work, and that doesn't come through here. So that's something to keep in mind as we delve into the pre-Raphaelites and try to understand a little bit more about them. Their goal, at least initially, was naturalism and realism, but uh, they went into so much detail that you often got these picturesque kinds of paintings. So a little bit about the pre-Raphaelite movement. It wasn't just a movement in art, but a cult cultural attitude. They called themselves the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and they very much exemplified um, a taste, a style, a belief system. The main impetus behind their movement was a revolt against the compositional practices of academic art of the day. So basically, they disagreed with the theories behind the composition of art in the Victorian period. And they believed these theories were still based on Raphael, the painter from Renaissance Italy, and they, they were um, just too technical. They weren't very realistic. It was, it was That was basically the complaint against the Raphael mode of painting that dominated the Victorian period before this movement. So they embraced medieval models, like pre-Renaissance, uh, because they believed those were more natural. Um, so to convey their new idea of naturalism or realism, they looked to earlier models from before Raphael. They thought you had to go back before Raphael to find pure naturalism, and that's where the title of the movement comes from. So they aspire to paint directly from nature, working in the open air, and William Holman Hunt actually constructed or had constructed a little shelter so he could paint at night from the light of the moon and still be outside, and so they really immersed themselves in nature and tried to convey nature um, as naturally as possible. They strove for, quote, photographic fidelity, unquote, is one of them said. And so I think you can see that in that previous image, that it does look like a photograph um, with its thorough detail. But, you know, perhaps some of the realism is lost because it, it tends to become very symbolic, I think. Um, they founded the journal, which was the first ever journal ever published by an artistic group. And, and Rossetti published some of his poems in there. To sum it all up, the central theme of pre-Raphaelite art was realism. Whether they achieved it or not, that was their goal. That's what they thought had been lost since the Raphaelite form had, had dominated painting. Um, but they, they didn't last too long. They were very influential, but they disbanded. disbanded. But a second group came about. Um, so the first group was Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who we're studying this lecture, um, John Ruskin, William Holman Hunt, who did the painting we just looked at, and, and that group eventually disbanded. So the next one had, uh, again, Rossetti started it, and this time it was with another poet, Charles Algernon Swinburne, and another prominent Victorian writer, William Morris. But there started to be a shift. So the goal before with the first wave was realism. But it was a very symbolic realism, which is why George Eliot critiqued it. The second wave went more straight to the symbolic. Um, one of uh, Rossetti's contemporaries in the second wave painted these mythological things. And what Rossetti really painted just all the time in the second movement was women. And um, he wanted to paint women, again, there was this thread of realism running through it. He wanted to paint women um, with curves and in a very, not necessarily idealistic way, what he felt was a very natural way of presenting women. And so that was kind of the thrust for him of the second movement. Um, and one thing they both had in common, besides at least a strand of realism, um, even if realism wasn't the main focus in the second wave, was the artist's relationship to society. So, you know, before they were responding to society's focus on Raphaelitism and de-emphasis on realism, they continued to explore the artist's relationship to society in the second wave. 
So that's a little bit about pre-Raphaelitism. It really influenced Victorian art and writing is why we studied it here. Um, here's a picture from the second wave of um, pre-Raphaelitism done by Rossetti. And, and so you can see the type of woman it portrays here. Uh, if you look at other paintings of women from the time, I should have placed one in here to juxtapose, it would be a little more idyllic, um, whereas this woman looks a, a little forlorn. And, and so I think you get there the idea of the realism he was going for. And the poem we're about to look at by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, it's called Jenny, <clears throat> and it's very characteristic of his poetry, and it's really informed by the second wave. Um, with the focus on the portrayal of women in a natural way. That's really what informs the poem we're about to look at. Um, so as I mentioned, the poem's called Jenny, and the basic premise of it is this speaker is sitting on the couch, I believe, in a prostitute's room, her apartment, and um, she's fallen asleep with her head on his lap. And so he's basically just sitting there kind of wondering things as she rests with her head on his lap. And so he's, it's basically kind of just his thoughts um, running through the whole lengthy poem here. But this poem uh, ended up becoming really influential. It, it engaged with some of the most prominent concerns of the day in the Victorian period. And that makes it quite fascinating. And And so what happens is you have this idea that he feels sympathy for Jenny. So he's this Victorian man who comes from the moral Victorian society, but he's decided to spend his evening with a prostitute. And as he lingers there and is in her room, um, he can't really get up and leave as she's sleeping on his lap. So as he lingers there, he has this experience where he becomes comes to better understand her world and her experiences. And so you have the meeting of these two very separate, different worlds and their distinctions defined Victorian society because prostitution was very much shamed and condemned during Victorian society. And so this um, speaker, who up to this point we can assume probably just used prostitutes and, and held the condemning beliefs of his society, he now, in this moment, as he has time to look about her room, the emotions he experiences, he now feels sympathy for Jenny the prostitute. And so the poem is really more about his psychological experiences than about her, um, but it's really about his confrontation with the sympathy, this colliding of worlds. He comes from this world that judges and condemns her, but now spending just a little bit of extra time in her world, he now has sympathy for him. What happens to him psychologically and what does he learn about her through that process? So that's what this poem is about and that's what we're going to explore. What ends up emerging as we explore that is a set of binaries, contradictory things going on at the same time. The first pair of binaries is the setting. So you have the Victorian world versus Jenny's room. If, as you read this poem, think about Rossetti as a painter. And so he's painting the scene inside Jenny's room, and we only really see Jenny's room. But that provides this small world that's juxtaposed with the larger Victorian world outside it, and it provides sort of a free space for the speaker, an escape from his moral Victorian world, where he's able to enter into the world of another um, more socially unacceptable person, enter into their world. Um, so his expectations versus his affections. If he were to, to um, react based solely on logic and morality, he would judge and condemn her based on his background, where he comes from, but he can't help feeling sympathy for her. So emotion or affection ends up becoming a really prominent, significant part of this poem. It's a poem that I would say argues for emotion over logic or thinking, feeling or emotion over logic or thinking, um, because he becomes enamored with, with Jenny's world and experiencing the truth and reality of it, and that ultimately outweighs his Victorian morality. There's also the theme of decency versus indecency. Victorians would consider Jenny indecent, but, but through being with her, he, he learns the ways in which she's decent. 
through spending the time in her room is what is what I meant by being with her. Um, socially acceptable versus socially unacceptable. She's considered um, not socially acceptable. She's socially unacceptable. But, you know, by the end of the poem, I don't know if the speaker agrees with that. I don't think Rosetti agrees with that. Um, <clears throat> so you can, you can probably thank me now. I'm not going to go through 300 plus lines of the poem, even though I went through all 98 lines with a buried life. We're just going to look at a couple of short passages, two stanzas and then several short sets of lines that reflect and, and build on the ideas I just introduced. So the second stanza says, This room of yours, my Jenny, looks A change from mine so full of books Whose serried ranks hold fast forsooth So many captive hours of youth The hours they feed from day and night To make one's cherished work come right And leave it wrong for all their theft Even as tonight my work is left Until I vowed that since my brain in eyes of dancing seem so fain, my feet should have some dancing too, and thus it was I met with you. Well, I suppose was hard to part, for here I am, and now, sweetheart, you seem too tired to get to bed. So the really key lines here are the opening ones. This room of yours, my Jenny, looks a change from mine so full of books. He's juxtaposing her room with his room, and... um in that sense, her room with the Victorian world. So the books, books in general are an important symbol he uses repeatedly all throughout the poem. And they represent the Victorian world because books represent logic and thinking. Um, they're scholarly academic. Those kinds of associations or connotations go with books. Um, whereas her room is more evoking emotion. He's moved by the emotion he feels in her room, and that's contrasted with the books. And so the books um, represent the judgmental Victorian world, whereas her room, which lacks the books that his has, represents emotion and feeling. We're going to look at um, a stanza later on that it, we're looking at it because it really deals with prostitution. And, and prostitution in many ways is the central concern of this poem, it was a huge concern during the Victorian day. Nay, nay, mere words, hear nothing mourns, as yet of winter sickness here, for want alone could wake in fear, nothing but passion wrings a tear, except where there may be, there may rise unsought, happily at times a passing thought, of the old days which seem to be much older than any history that is written in any book, when she would lie in fields and look along the ground through the blown grass and wonder where the city was, for out of sight whose boil and bell they told her then for a child's tale. So this line, this stanza, excuse me, really deals with the city and modernity. And prostitution, I'm sure, has been around since the beginning of time. You know, that phrase is the world's oldest profession, but prostitution emerged as a prime concern during the Victorian period. The industrialization, urbanization of capitalism led to, to many people losing their jobs who didn't have them before or changing circumstances, moving from the country to the city. Um, and so, so many people ended up becoming impoverished who, who weren't before. And so many of the women who became impoverished turned to prostitution. And so prostitution is very much even though it's an older tradition, it's very much associated with the modern world. Because um, you also had men who now could, a, could afford to go to prostitutes and, and use prostitutes more regularly. You had more prostitutes than before. It became kind of a social phenomena, would be the best way to describe it during the Victorian period. And as Victorians became aware of it, they became obsessed with it. As I mentioned before, the Victorians, because of the printing and literacy developments, just wrote and wrote and wrote. And so in the newspapers and the journals, they wrote and wrote and wrote about prostitution and debated and debated and debated it. And so I'd argue here, Rossetti's making the argument that it's prostitution and Jenny's lifestyle is more a development and effect of living in the modern world than truly like a choice on her part. She's been 
economic circumstances, you could argue, forced women into prostitution. They didn't have a lot of other options during the Victorian period. And so with the references um, to lying in fields in the last few lines here, perhaps in another earlier pre-modern, pre-industrial time and place, Jenny would have been able to live as a pure woman. So what you have happening is he spends more time in her room and contemplates her lifestyle and feels sympathy for her. He starts to perhaps better understand her circumstances and the conditions that have led to her lifestyle, which makes him less quickly to rush, rush to judging that lifestyle. Um, now just a few um, short sets of lines that are very important. Um, a little bit later in the poem, he repeats this line, for honor and dishonor made, two sister vessels, here's one. So he repeats this line twice. And first he describes his cousin Mel, who's the girl he's proudest of. And then the second time he says that line, he then talks about Jenny. And so he's comparing Jenny and Mel. And in doing this, I think he and he's making the argument that the prostitution is beyond her control. It might not be a choice. And he's really feeling sympathy for her here because he's seeing similarities to his cousin Nell, who's his favorite. He's most proud of her. Even though she's not a prostitute, he's seeing connections between the two of them. So he's going even further here with his sympathy, and he's seeing Jenny's humanity. He's not seeing her as this, this, this morally debased individual. He's seeing her as someone who has similarities to someone he would consider pure or innocent or um, decent. And then further on, he says, like a rose shut in a book in which pure women cannot look. And so this is a really important line. It carries on <coughs> the book imagery. And he often compares Jenny to a flower or a rose. So if the Victorian world is represented by books and Jenny is represented by um, uh, um, a rose, then the book has kind of enclosed her. And so these are probably the two most important lines in the poem, because even from just two lines, we can get all of what I'm about to share with you. One important idea here, and this comes up all throughout the poem, is that Jenny's thoughts are penetrable. He starts the poem by wanting to see into her mind, and he's not really able to. He has to conjecture. And so there's a number of lines where that show that he can't really penetrate her mind. But in this line in particular, it says, in which pure women cannot look. So they cannot look inside this book where the rose Jenny is trapped. And so her thoughts are also not penetrable by Victorian society or pure women. Um, so the flower represents Jenny. Feeling and emotion are associated with flowers. The book, again, represents Victorian society and thinking. Um, so Victorian society has enclosed the strangling this flower. What this means is it's not Jenny's actions as a prostitute that make her indecent or impure a fallen woman. It is Victorian society's judgment of those actions that describe her that way. And so he's really kind of bridge the gap between them. He's now as sympathetic for her as he can be. He's no longer saying, he's saying that the negative things associated with you are not your fault, basically, is what he's come to think about her. And so this leads to the revelation of the poem. The truth about Jenny, he learns from being in her room, is that she's a decent person caught in a bad situation. She's not a bad person for being a prostitute, is the succinct way to put that. Um, and um, this truth is closed off to the rest of Victorian society just as it was closed off to him before he entered her room because Victorian society is narrow-minded. That's why they can't look inside the book. So what did we learn from reading this poem closely? The central idea is that Jenny is pure or decent in her own way. He often compares her to the Virgin Mary. In the first stanza, line 18, he even uses the term full of grace to describe her. So um, her profession in the Victorian world causes her to be described by society as impure or decent. But once um, having this emotional connection with her and her setting, 
um, he sees her as, as pure and decent in a different way, even if society doesn't. Some things that go along with this. He travels from one world, Victorian society, to another, Jenny's room. We've talked about what each of these represent. Um, but this was kind of a trope in Victorian literature. The middle and upper class Victorian readers wanted to travel vicariously to the seedy underworlds of the lower and working class when reading literature. So they wanted to basically read literature about the people they judged. And Dickens often provided this opportunity. Dickens often wrote about the underworld of Victorian society. And he had police inspectors or other characters who, like the speaker here, could act as kind of a conduit or a guide into the city underworld. But Rossetti plays with, subverts this expectation because um, the setting of Jenny's room, which is the painting here, you know, the main focus of the poem, is is not a city underworld. It's, it's what evokes his emotion, his sympathy for her. So he flips these expectations on their head when he guides these upper class reading readers into Jenny's world. Um, so he feels the strong emotional connection to and sympathy for her when in her room. And this causes him, at least while he's there, to abandon his Victorian morality and logic. He's able to, to see things from her perspective. Um, I say at least temporarily, because we don't know what happens when he leaves. We don't see that. And, and so I wonder if this only occurs while he's there, or if, um, or if, um, it would last, if it would have a permanent influence on him or not. I think that's a question worth pursuing further. I'd love to hear what you think about it. We can only conjecture. Um, like I said before, this poem is reflective of the second wave of pre-Raphaelitism, where Rossetti wanted to emphasize earthly sensuality of the women he painted. So like that painting we saw a few slides ago, he wanted to present women in a very natural way. And this is about as natural as you can get because he's interacting with a prostitute or he's not really interacting with her. He's thinking about her life. Um, but he, he's trying, he's, he's, he keeps delving deeper as the poem goes. And as he does, he has more sympathy for her. So he's trying to get to the most natural state of understanding her, you could say. And that's that she's decent. She's a good, decent person, even though she's doing something society disapproves of. That's the most natural characterization of her. So that's how it relates to his philosophy about painting. Um, and finally, um, his inability to penetrate her mind. He doesn't ever really know what she thinks. All of this is just conjecture um, on his part. And there's a number of lines that show us this. It exposes the Victorian obsession with and fixation on prostitution. So... He's doing here what many Victorians did, which was debating, contemplating prostitution. He lands on a very anti-Victorian side of it, but he's still performing the same act, thoroughly discussing prostitution the way many Victorians did at the time. And so uh, I leave you with questions. I was almost going to do a slide on questions and I didn't, but I want to leave a few questions in your mind as we move on here. Um, one would be, is this, you know, a feminist or not so much feminist work? He seems to be really arguing for the, the decency, the human decency of this prostitute, but it's all from his perspective. It's all filtered through his lens. And so is this just kind of, you know, masculine conjecture or does he make, you know, an important point here? And then while he is disagreeing, you know, with the Victorian judgments of her, um, we come, I come back to that question. Does this only take place while he's in her room or does it last? And, and similarly, you know, to what extent does he clash with Victorian values? Or, you know, is he ultimately reinforcing them by conjecturing so much about a prostitute's life without really ever letting her speak at all? So these are some questions I still have that I'd love to hear what you think about them. But I think either way, this is a fascinating poem that reveals a lot to us about the Victorian period, especially about pre-Raphaelitism, but also the Victorian fixation on prostitution.